Thank you for inviting me. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, Mr. Kurzweil's uh, immortality. Mr. Kurzweil is a real person. He's a real person and he has written some books. What is Mr. Kurzweil's immortality? Let's start with this question. Let's put it in one, or actually in, in two lines. If you make it to 2045, if you live till 2045, then you will never die. Then you will become immortal. Looks like you have a pretty good chance. Even I have a chance. Even I have a chance if I die a little bit. So, immortality. I thought you were all attracted by the title immortality, but it seems this is a, a course that you have to take, right? You have to show up. Okay has nothing to do with immortality or with my personality, maybe. Okay, so the idea is that in 2045, we are all going to be immortal. So I'm going to talk about immortality as envisioned by Raymond Kurzweil, born 1948. So he's about nine years older than me, but he's still alive and he has written books. So on, on TED, I, I learned that you're supposed to take jitsu -butsu to show things to the audience. And so here, here is jitsu -butsu. The singularity is near, a book from 2005, and how to create a mind from 2012. It's a little slimmer. Altogether, about a thousand pages. And well, it talks about this Singularity. It talks about computers and the human mind. Can computers become humans? Can they become like humans? Can they emulate humans? Can they imitate humans? And things like that. Now, Mr. Kurzweil, of course, believes that that indeed is the case. So, should we believe him? What kind of person is he? Well, he is, uh, well, the real thing. He is an entrepreneur and inventor. He was involved in developing first versions of OCR, op optical character recognition, scanners, speech recognition, and synthesis. And right now, at the ripe old age of 64, 65, or whatever, he is, since December, working for Google to help Google understand natural language. If you have been using Google Translate, maybe you're aware of the fact that Google does maybe need a little help in that area. You know Google Translate? Have you used it? You like it? Right? <laughs> so, we are not that far yet. Natural language understanding. But, David Kutzwa is the real thing. He's looking for immortality. He's not the first person searching for immortality, wanting to become immortal. Immortality is an ancient dream. 5,000 years ago, the king of Uruk, Gilgamesh, looked for immortality. 2,000 and a few years ago, the first Chinese emperor, Xin no Shikote, looked for immortality. How did they do it? Gilgamesh went to the centers of Lebanon, into the woods, to look for immortality. That doesn't seem like a very good idea these days, because if you go there, there'll be some other people called Hezbollah, and uh, they may have a quite different idea about immortality, which may actually involve killing you immortality for the greater glory of God. So <clears throat> going to the centers of Lebanon is not a good idea. What the uh, emperor did was even less reasonable. He uh, apparently took mercury to extend his life and that didn't work and shortened his life of course. He died at 49 or something. I'm not sure. But nowadays we have something the fountain of eternal life. The 
Let's get a bit more. Gindai tiki? What is that? There it is. Ah, you can. Can you see it? I can hardly see it. Okay. The, mount, uh, the fountain of eternal life is uh, this monument. Can you really see this? You can hardly see it. There is a, there is a figure there. Copper, greenish. A little bit like the monument in front of Saitama Daigaku. Uh, but you can tell that this is not Saitama Daigaku because there's a bicycle there. It's not inside Saitama Daigaku. Where is this? This is in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. On the shores of Lake Erie. Cleveland is famous for the uh, Cuyahoga River that used to burst into flames every five years because of oil slicks. The Burning River, have you heard of it? environmental quest. But this is cleaned up now actually. They're doing dragon boat races now on the Cuyahoga. Okay, but this is also of course not a serious answer for uh, <coughs> our question. Where do we find uh, immortality? If we look for immortality we have to be a bit more serious. So let's start at zero. <coughs> we have to ask what is immortality? What are we that we can become? Possibly immortal. What would it mean that we become immortal? Well, seriously, and I sort of agree with this, there is a way, in principle, perhaps, to immortality. If human minds, if we, if I, if human minds are computer programs, computers are computer programs, then if that's all that counts, then we can just upload ourselves. We can just store this computer program in some sort of memory in the cloud or somewhere. And then we become immortal, right? We can be copied, right? We're just a computer program, like Windows 7 with the office suit, you know? Windows 7 with the office suit is immortal, don't you think? There will always be a copy remaining. There are millions of them right now, so that is a way for us, if we are just computers, to become immortal. Okay, now you think I'm crazy. You do? You don't? You should. Anyway, it's not my idea, right? It's the, the guy who wrote the book, right? Chitsubutsu here, there it is. This is what I'm talking about. I'm only talking about these books. I don't really know anything about the science behind it. Not really, anyway. It's all from books. Books. So this guy wrote this, uh, these books where he promises people to live forever. And he's on the cover of Wired Magazine. Maybe you know Wired Magazine, maybe you don't. He's also on the cover of <coughs> the uh, Colorado Springs Independent. Famous, no, not famous, not famous at all. Uh, magazine, Colorado. Uh, and time. Okay, now that's the real thing, right? So this guy is taken seriously by some people. He made it on the cover of time. I can't read what this is. This is I like maybe this year. I don't know. Last year. <coughs> well, when this book came out, of course, right? Together with the book, I make a little bit more money and get on the cover of time. So His idea is that the brain is a computer, and this idea is taken seriously, a serious and timely idea. Not so radically new, really, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> the human mind is just a computer. This guy, I better, Monsieur Julien Offray de la Métrie, wrote Long Machine. Even if you don't know French, you probably understand. <coughs> Human machine, the man as a machine, in 1748, to argue against Descartes and dualism. You know the philosophical question: Do we have a soul? What is the soul? If we have a soul, what is the relation of the soul to the body? Are they separate or are they just one thing? So Descartes says they are separate. There is some mysterious thing going on. And Mr. Lamitri says, well, no, it's just a machine, a clock, or something like that. 
like this is the age of Newton, right? So a machine, a mechanical device, a mill, a clock, an astrolab, or something like that. But this is actually not where we're going, <coughs> because we are not talking about levers and wheels. We are going to talk about computers, right? Computers, computer programs. Now, if you look inside the computer, if you really look closely, everything is reduced to zeros and ones, right? Computer programs are just zeros and ones. So, the idea that a computer, <coughs> that the computer could be a human mind, that the brain maybe is just a computer, goes back to an even older idea than the machine idea, and that is the idea that life, the universe, and everything can be explained by simple symbols. Here's a binary scheme to <coughs> explain the universe. Do you know it? Does anybody know it? What is this? Where does this come from? It's two or three or four thousand years old. The Book of Changes, the I Ching, uh, or I Ching. I have no idea how these Chinese words are supposed to be pronounced. Uh, and it's 64 different symbols, binary encoded, uh, which are supposed to explain everything. Like, for instance, your future. You can use it for Buddha night. You can predict the future. Here's another object. This is the oldest one today, 20 to 30,000 years old from Europe, the Venus of Willendorf. It's called the Venus because people thought, well, it probably has a religious purpose, right? It's a fertility goddess, right? If you treat her right, if you treat her right, you can have many children. That's the idea. And another exhibit here. <clears throat> the beginning of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word was God. The word, word here is... Greek word logos. This was written in Greek. <laughs> okay, so once more, what's the idea? The idea is that these symbols, these images, words, mean power. Yeah, there's the uh, ikikyo. Math schemes, magic pictures, and mystic logic. Explain the universe, give us power over the universe, maybe are the universe. Okay. So the idea once more, man is a symbol manipulator. Now this came about at the time that we invented language, right? These kind of things started manipulating symbols, started writing, started painting. The mind, the universe, reality is information. All that counts is information. It doesn't matter that there's a proton there, so to speak. It just uh, is the information that's carried by it that is important. Or then, again, to get to my field, I wasn't introduced like that, but I'm, I'm basically, I used to be a mathematician, let's say that, let's put it that way. I used to do math, so to get to my field, it's all math. Because if we want to really talk about symbols and information, first we have to have a mathematical foundation, right? Just as for physics or chemistry and so on and so forth, you need a mathematical foundation. So it's all math in the end. Okay, fundamental math one. Now I was hoping that maybe I could rely on you having seen this already in high school, but I was informed by my children that that is maybe not the case. So, this is going to be very difficult. Let's see, who has heard of the name Georg Cantor? Cantor. 
set theory. Who knows set theory? Nobody? <laughs> set theory. You don't know? You don't know what set theory is? Okay, so this is very difficult. So we have to sort of skip a while, uh, skip through this. Anyway, we don't have time, so don't expect to understand it completely, what I'm doing now. <coughs> All right. <laughs> Fundamental math. There is this scheme. Have you seen it? Right. Apparently not. It is used for a diagonal argument. What is this supposed to be? What is it all about? Okay, it's about the real numbers. You know numbers. You know the natural numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? You know the integers. Now, the, there are more integers than natural numbers, apparently, right? There are negative numbers, too, right? So, well, not really. Because you can count the integers, too. 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, so on. They are also just countable, okay? And then there are the rational numbers. If you jiggle it a little bit, you can count them too. Then there are the real numbers. Real numbers have <coughs> decimal expansions, right? So R1 is the decimal expansion of some number. Maybe R8 is the decimal expansion of uh, 0 0.314 goes on like pi. Uh, <coughs> We try to enumerate in this scheme, from top to bottom, enumerate R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and so on, all the real numbers, and, uh, well, can we hope that this scheme, this enumeration, contains all the real numbers? Well, the trick is that we look at the diagonal. Now, the diagonal maybe is also a real number, right? It's also going to give us a real number. This, uh, stuff uh, is also going to be a real number <coughs> and it may be in the scheme of course maybe R, R59 R59 is equivalent to the diagonal maybe but what if we change the diagonal at some point if we change the diagonal at one point then it won't be there anymore so we change the whole diagonal everywhere and that will make sure that each number R1 up to R8, and so on. It's going to be different from the new change diagonal. Okay. That is the idea, a diagonal argument. And it proves that, oops, went the wrong way. There is no such enumeration. The real numbers, the number of real numbers is bigger than the number of natural numbers. There are more of them. There are lots of real numbers, more than natural numbers. And if you con continue this argument, you find out that there are many sizes of these infinities, actually. At the time, this was very interesting. Even to the church, they said, no, this can't be. We can have only one infinity because infinity is God. So we can have two infinities. You are a heretic. So Mr. <coughs> Cantor actually didn't have such a really happy life. Even in the mathematical community, many people didn't believe what he was doing. How can human beings deal with infinity. But actually we can. This is accepted mathematics. And as I said, I sort of expect you to <coughs> learn that in high school. Okay. Infinity. All right. Then, another thing. Computers. Computers and infinity. Okay. Who has heard the name Turing? Raise your hands. Alan Turing. Englishman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, Turing. <laughs> Even before there were computers, somebody thought it was kind of a neat idea if there were computers. So he invented the uh, Turing machine, which you can think of as a programming language like C or basis, BASIC or C++, whatever you like. Maybe Python. Programming language. What's a program? A program is a finite string of symbols, right? So all the programs that exist, you can enumerate. You can enumerate all the programs, and that's what we do. We do the same thing. Instead of enumerating all the real numbers, taking the diagonal and showing that there's one real number that we missed, we are going to enumerate all the programs, 
and take the diagonal and show that there's a program that we missed. But now, so we enumerate all programs. Okay. Yes, I wasn't very precise about uh, what the scheme is supposed to be. So P1, P2 are the programs, and of course the, uh, these are inputs, right? And the programs compute numbers from numbers. They're given number output. Okay. So we have the scheme, and we are computing along there. And this can be done because you can design a universal Turing machine or a universal C interpreter or something like that. Uh, that there's no problem with doing that kind of thing. So now the conclusion, after taking the diagonal and changing it, is yes, there is an enumeration because we are only enumerating finite strings, right? Programs, finite programs. We can do that. There is such an enumeration. And this is different from the previous argument. There is an enumeration, but the programs that we enumerate actually don't always give us answers. They run, and they run, and they run, and they don't stop. They don't give an answer. They hang, they crash, whatever. So <clears throat> the programs always don't always give answers. They may loop. And Okay, so we say, all right, so we check this in advance. Given a program, we check it. Is it a good program or not, right? Bill Gates will check it for us. No, that cannot be done. This argument actually shows that this cannot be done, and we get a result that says the halting problem for Turing machines is unsolvable. There are unsolvable problems in mathematics. Not everything can be solved. Okay. So we have infinity, and we have unsolvable problems. Next, all right. Turing's result was 1933, I think. Uh, 30, 36, I'm sorry. 1936. And there was actually, a, four years earlier, there was a result in logic by Kurt Gödel. He took the statement, this statement is not provable, this statement is not cool. So this is similar to the statement, this statement is a lie. Right? So you get into trouble with that. Right? Is it true or not? Is it false? True? I say this statement is a lie. Right? So he takes a statement similar to that. This statement is not provable. He takes the statement, this statement is not provable. And he encodes it in math, in arithmetic. He puts it into math. So then we have this statement. Funny statement it is, but we have a statement, interesting statement, so to speak, because this statement, well, can it be proven? No, it cannot be proven. It better not be possible to prove it, because if we could prove it, since it's not supposed to be provable, then we'd have a contradiction, so arithmetic would not be consistent. Mujumar, inconsistent, gomi, rubbish, arithmetic, you know, sansu. Ah, arithmetic is Sansu, right? Sansu becomes nonsense. So, um, we have this statement, which is, which cannot be proven, but if it cannot be proven, then it is true, right? It is true. The statement is true. So, we cannot prove it, and of course a computer program that searches for proofs and so on cannot prove it, but we know that it's true. Well, maybe, maybe this is slightly overstating the case. But anyway, let's leave it at this for, this mo for the moment. <coughs> so uh, here is a picture yeah, of an ambitious computer who wanted to figure out where is first incompleteness theorem. Yeah, maybe prove the statement so and work. It looped, right? All right. All right. Don't try this at home. Yes. Okay. So, uh, oops. Ah, joke. Yes. Uh, nobody laughed. Okay. Fundamental math. So, what does math, basic math, fundamental math, tell us about computers? Right. And uh, a little bit more. First, it tells.
tells us that humans do have a gra grasp of infinity. Do computers have that? Uh, humans know problems that computers cannot solve. And humans know, wrong button, some truth that can't be proven by computation. Okay. So it looks that man has an advantage here over computers, right? But the thing is that all these mathematical, this is math after all, right? All these mathematical things uh, can be formalized and a computer can actually prove all the things that Kurt Berle can prove or that I can prove, so. <clears throat> there is not really a difference. So my opinion as an expert on this, so to speak, is that this is not a good argument to say that computers cannot imitate human beings. So I wrote this down here. Mathematical theorems do not elevate man above the machine. Okay. Next. So, in principle, from a mathematical point of view, it is possible that computers can imitate, implement, emulate a brain. So what is a brain? Well, it's, you have seen these kind of pictures, right? A brain, brain, brain. Maybe you have seen a picture like that. What is it? Neurons, right? Neurons glowing in the dark. And axons, axon, yeah, but this is the axon. Neurons, axons, dendrites, synapses, and electricity. The whole thing runs on electricity just like a computer. So go ahead. <laughs> Only much, much slower, right? It's uh, electrochemical, it's rather slow actually. So, well, so maybe, maybe we can build a brain. Computer. I said neurons, but of course it's important. How many are there, right? We just saw like 10 or 15 or 20. How many neurons are there? Well, it depends, of course, on whether you're talking about human beings or uh, nematodes, C. elegans, this guy, the only picture I have here, C. elegans, the nematode. It's a small worm that uh, worms around in the soil, whatever. Uh, has exactly 302 neurons, at least one variety of them. Exactly 302 neurons, and they have been completely mapped. So people can really build a brain for this worm. The fruit fly already has 100,000, that's a lot. The cockroach, a million. Just imagine how many, how many neurons you killed today. The mouse has 75 million. The cat, already a billion. Ship has seven times that much. The elephant, again, three times about that much, and the human being has 86 uh, billion neurons. This apparently is a fairly exact figure. I read an article where uh, somebody said, oh, we always thought there are 100 billion. Let's check it, and they checked it, and they found it was actually not 100 billion, but only 86 billion neurons. So, 302 to 86 billion. Well, most of this is from Wikipedia. Yes. Uh, so, how does it compare? We want to build a brain. How does it compare to a supercomputer? Now, since we don't know how the brain works, this is very, a really delicate or difficult or actually an easy question because you can just make things up. So, we just make things up. So, we have a uh, 100 billion neurons, okay, I mean, come on, those are 14 billion, we don't care, right? Uh, uh, 100 billion neurons, and, well, what does one neuron do, right? You saw the picture of the neuron, and it's very complicated. Maybe it can do a thousand things at a time. Maybe it has a thousand things, a thousand states, a thousand dimensions that it moves in. And how fast is it? Oh, all right, all right. Yeah, well, neurons are slow. This number is also sort of known, right? This is sort of what it can do, maybe every... Uh, 10 microseconds, something can happen. So, 100 cycles per second. 
are maybe possible. So if you multiply all this together, maybe the capacity of a human brain is 10 to the 16 uh, floating point operations per second flops. All these computers are married. Measured in flops. Okay, so then we look at K. This was one of the nice discoveries when I uh, wrote up this. Well, that's, this is practically exactly the same number, right? <laughs> this estimate and this uh, capacity, this uh, computing power for the uh, computer that's in, in Kobe, uh, built by Fujitsu, Fujitsu uh, is, has just about this much power. So maybe they could imitate uh, a human brain straight out. Of course, that means if the brain is just uh, this computation stuff, right? So now here, the uh, thousand parameters are just made up, yeah? So let's do another estimate. Look at the synapses, right? The connections between the dendrites, axons, and stuff. The connections between the neurons. There are a lot more connections than there are neurons. Many connections. So actually, there are 10 to the 15 synapses. So if we assume that these synapses can do one thing every one tenth of a second, then we get the same estimate, right? Now the problem, why does K not replace the uh, uh, Abishinzo? Right? Why do we not use K to have a, a really intelligent prime minister? Uh, well, the reason for this is that we don't have the software, right? We can simulate the weather or something like that. Right? So this is very simple, simulating the weather, right? You just have a zillions and zillions of data points, and they do one thing, they move, they have a temperature. But that's all. So this is much simpler than what's going on in uh, brains or even in teacups, maybe. So <clears throat> the software is the problem, yes. What is a brain? But, but. Maybe you have heard of Moore's law. Moore's law says that the number of uh, transistors that you can put on a uh, chip doubles every so and so many months. There's some disagreement with what Mr. Moore actually said, uh, like <coughs> every two years or so. So. I want to argue that numbers don't matter. No matter what uh, baseline you have, as long as things are sort of, notice this is a logarithmic plot here, right? So this almost straight lines means exponential growth. So the pro processor performance uh, for, well, this is just for, for PCs, I think. Uh, rows doubles every, wait a second, 1.8 years it says. Yes, performance of computers doubles every 1.8 years. This is also true for supercomputers and things like that. You get almost the same kind of thing. And the cost decays exponentially. The cost goes down and down and down. And 10 to the minus 19 dollars per cycle or whatever is written here. Of course, at this point, this is an estimate. So, if as long as we have this exponential growth in computing power and reduction in cost, it really doesn't matter. The computers will be powerful enough. So, yeah. wrap up. So what did we get so far about computers and the brain? One, well, math doesn't really decide anything. In principle, maybe it's possible to build a computer that is a brain, but there are insolvable problems in math. And computer power grows exponentially, so it will catch up. Nobody's laughing. We had this joke, catch up. Catch up. All right. Okay. Now we did math. We did computing power. What about philosophy? Consciousness, ishiki, kokoro, mind. 
Can a computer have a mind? Mind. All right. So a computer will not know what it all means. It doesn't have an eye. It cannot say, I wonder. It has no mind, no consciousness. You might say. Some people say. Is that so? So let's talk about consciousness. Consciousness. Do you... I just want to present this list and you should just decide for yourself. What do you think? The virus presumably doesn't have consciousness. What about the bacteria? Bacteria, for instance, run away from uncomfortable conditions, you know, chemotaxis. What about nematodes, right? The guy with the 302 neurons that we had before. What about a cicada, a tree, a bird, even a smart bird that can talk? Do these birds not have any consciousness? What about cats? dogs, chimps, humans. So, does consciousness really start down here? Is there, is there a fat line there so that, yeah, only this guy has consciousness. <coughs> Can we say that? And if we take a human being, we are in all kinds of states. Our minds are in all kinds of states. For instance, we are asleep. Are we conscious when we are asleep? When we are asleep. What about when we are asleep and we are dreaming, right? When we are in love, blind love. When we hate somebody, blind hate. When we are in a rage. When we have a mental, di metal, uh, mental disease, of which there are a lot. Under anesthesia, in a coma. You know, there is waking coma. People in the waking coma, do they have consciousness? The man who mistook his wife for a hack. If something is wrong with your brain, if you have a brain tumor, the damnest thing ha things happen. This is a, actually a book by a famous psychologist. And there was apparently this case where this man thought that his wife was his hat. So she, he, she, when he tried to put her on his <coughs> head. Very strange, right? Okay, drunkenness. Oops. Drunkenness. Drugs. All right. So all kinds of consciousness. So all I want to say with this is consciousness seems to come in various kinds of degrees, right? It's not you're conscious or you're not. Like, am I conscious right now? I'm very nervous. I'm giving this talk. I'm only talking about the talk, right? And I'm only thinking about the talk. Is that consciousness? There is an experiment, a thought experiment, by a famous philosopher called John Searle. John Searle puts an Englishman into a Chinese room, as he called it. It's a very simple experiment. Imagine a man in a room, an Englishman who doesn't speak any Chinese, so it's not Needham, uh, and he gets Chinese questions. Can anybody read this? I had to look at it, I had to Google it too. It's a, it's a New Year's greeting something, something like that. Uh, so you answer it with thanks, thanks. So the answer actually here is here. Here, here, right? Thanks, thanks. What are you, man? You're a man. Okay. So this guy is in this room and he gets these Chinese questions or prompts and he answers. How does he answer? Well, he doesn't speak Chinese, so he has a huge book, a manual. And he just looks it up. He has a list, he looks it up. Okay. And he outputs correct answers. That's the idea. We imagine that he puts out correct answers. So this system, Mr. Searle claims, is like a computer. And as we can see here, Although the computer can perform 
answer in a Chinese conversation, it really doesn't understand anything. The man doesn't understand anything because he doesn't know Chinese, and the rest is just book, books, right? It's a book. So there's no consciousness, there's no mind, no ishiki, no I there. Well, you should just think about that. My opinion on this is that uh, this is nonsense. Because if you take your brain, if you take your brain and you divide it up, and look at what happens while you're talking or listening to my talk, my parts of the brain also don't understand, for instance, Japanese or English. <coughs> No single neuron understands anything. No single neurons. It's all the neurons together. Everything working together that makes it work. So if we really want, if we want to imagine that this is a computer, we have to have a, an integrated system with Google search, at least man, manual and a good search system. But if we have a good search system, then that's completely different. Then things completely change, and the whole thing maybe can be considered to be conscious and have a personality. Okay, this is my opinion on that. Consciousness wrap up. Consciousness seems to come in all kinds of flavors and styles, and most importantly, degrees, amounts. Can a desktop computer emulate a nematode? It would seem that it could. Maybe even an ant or a fruit fly and including whatever consciousness they have. So what I think, my opinion, is that consciousness arises from this huge complexity and integration of all the processes in our brain. It's what is called an emergent characteristic or an emergent phenomenon. Okay, consciousness, wrap up. Now the wrap up of everything. Math doesn't really decide anything but points to unsolvable problems. Exponential growth of computers is going to catch up. Uh, it looks, in fact, if you look at K, that maybe we are already there. Maybe we can build a computer, but the software is a problem. Consciousness is an emergent characteristic. If a system is complex enough, it will become conscious. My opinion. Okay, so far we have talked about the brain as if it were a digital computer. We have just assumed that, right? We have said so and so many neurons, so and so many cycles per second, and so on. But what about these neurons? They are far more than just axon and dendrites. They have a, a nucleus, they have ribosomes, they have a Golgi apparatus, they have membranes, <coughs> microtubules, and all kinds of stuff. It's all chemistry, very complicated chemistry, biochemistry. <coughs> So a neuron is a cell, it has a nucleus, ribosomes, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, ER, chemistry, quantum mechanics. So the whole thing is full of Schrodinger's cats. Right? You have heard of Schrodinger's cat, I hope. Right? So there's all these quantum phenomena going on inside the cell. Now, there are some fairly famous scientists, Roger Penrose. Maybe you have heard of Roger Penrose. You have heard of Georgia Penrose, right? Georgia Penrose, of the Penrose tiles. Anyway, a famous uh, English physicist and mathematician argues against Mr. Kurzweil, uh, explicitly against uh, what uh, Kurzweil was saying, Although already a little earlier, well, because even before he wrote these books, Mr. Kurzweil was uh, uh, proposing his theories. He wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind, The Emperor's New Mind, The Emperor's New Clothes, right? You know the story of the Emperor's New Clothes. So uh, the claim was basically that these computer scientists that want to build a human brain, they don't know what they're doing. So he starts with Gödel Turing to show that computers cannot be human. 
Now, I said, I don't believe that. I don't accept that. I don't think Google Turing has anything to do with whether computers can uh, be human, or humans are just computers. And he argues that these microtubules, uh, they were in the previous picture. I didn't point them out, but uh, these are very tiny, 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 tiny fibers that they do quantum computing in our brains, which may be, I don't know, after all. Then he relates this to quantum gravity, which doesn't really exist yet, and uh, universal consciousness is brought out in the brain, so he explains uh, consciousness with some recourse to something like God, like the universe, and that sounds pretty crazy to me. So, anyway, we should keep in mind, though, that the idea that the brain is only a digital computer may be completely wrong because it's actually a quantum computer, okay? So, non-digital, yeah, if we have quantum mechanics, another little argument, since quantum mechanics exists, and since everything is based on quantum mechanics, and since nature and evolution are pretty sneaky, evolution usually fills those niches, discovers those phenomena that it can use, maybe evolution should have discovered quantum computing. But there is something that speaks against it. If we say quantum computing, and you may have heard about quantum computing, and the, the first steps have been made, those are lab experiments, usually taking place in liquid nitrogen or helium or something like that, you know? Are they useful quantum phenomena in a warm and wet place like the human brain? I don't know. But then again, electricity runs the human brain, so warm and wet, but still electricity does it. But then again, I argue here that since there is quantum mechanics, nature should have discovered it. Well, maybe not, because nature also didn't discover the wheel, right? So there are some things that nature just can't really do, although we can maybe. So it's all quantum mechanics. It's quantum mechanics all the way down, but we don't know if there are any non-electrochemically, if there are any non-electrochemical phenomena in the human brain. We don't know that. So, wrap up again. Math has unsolvable problems for us. Exponential growth, oops. Exponential growth is sure to get us there. Consciousness emerges and quantum stuff, well, we don't know. <coughs> don't know. Again. Can we build a brain? Can we build your brain? If we build a brain or your brain, we have to look what a brain is, right? We have to scan it. Uh, Mr. Kurzweil was involved in developing scanners, right? So we need to scan the brain. And brain scanning actually has been in the news, these kind of pictures, functional MRI, <coughs> where you show the subject something and you measure the metabolic activity down here. And then you say, oh, yeah, I can tell when this guy is looking at chocolate. Or here he's looking at his cat. Okay, I don't know. All right, but this really doesn't tell us anything, right? In fact, this is just, look, this is uh, metabolic activity, you know, how much sugar is being used uh, in the brain. So this is definitely not precise enough. But... But very recently, just after, in fact, I uh, escaped and tried to play the, the movie. Just double click there.
Try once. Of course, we don't have time, so this is not going to go on quite far, don't worry. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Okay, it didn't work. But I'm prepared for that. This was supposed to be a movie. It was a movie which moves through the hippocampus of a mouse. Uh, let's go forward. Ah, yes, please return. Let's go forward. Okay, it was a movie of uh, this in motion, <coughs> so to speak. I mean, showing this structure from all kinds of angles, right? Three-dimensional movie, so to speak. And this is the hippocampus of a mouse, which has been put into gelatin, and it is translucent, and it can be stained so that you can See what? Well, the uh, abstract is very uh, explicit about that. So you get high re resolution information in a nanoporous, porous, hydrogel, hybridized, 3D, fully assembled, optically transparent micromolecule permeable gel. Shows long range projections, that's long axons, which go from one part of the brain to the other, long range projections. Local circuit wiring, dendrites and things like that. Cellular relationships, subcellular structures, protein complexes, nucleic acids, neurotransmitters. You can do in situ hybridization, immunochemistry, <coughs> with multiple rounds of staining and destaining, and anti body labeling, uh, fine structural analysis, and so on and so forth. So you can really get a lot of information out of this brain in a, in a gel. Here it is again. So you can really tell here, right? Here. Neurons, axons, whatever. You can tell how the brain is wired. And that was from nature of uh, two weeks ago. For the first time, something like that had been done. In uh, Stanford University by Names. Okay. <coughs> Scan a brain, exponential growth. Okay, again. So scanning. All right, this is a dead brain, of course. If we want to make a copy of you, maybe we should check what your live living brain is doing, right? So here is non invasive brain scanning, uh, according to uh, Ray Kurzweil. Now, this is also, of course, logarithmic, uh, logarithmic graph, exponential growth, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, there are not very many data points. You know, there's 1975 to 1995. There's there's only two data points there at the end uh, of this uh, interval. So I am not really sure that, based on so few data points, you can say that there is for sure exponential growth in non-invasive brain scanning from now on. So that is. Um, well, a difficult problem. Well, if you can't scan the brain from the outside, maybe you can scan it from the inside. Nanobots. Nanobots are, of course, nanoscale robots. Nanoscale robots. That you put, for instance, in huge numbers, put, inject them into blood circulation, so they would go into your brain, they would attach to neurons, and they would report on what these neurons are doing. But, but it, this hasn't been done, of course, right? I mean, there doesn't exist a single uh, nanobot yet. Even, even a 10 times as large thing doesn't exist. If you, if you make 
a thousand times as large, maybe yes. But uh, we have some things like that. But that's just a just a probe. So I'm not convinced that these nanobots are practical. Maybe they are, but I don't know. And uh, as I said, based on this graph, I'm not convinced that they exist. Again, the graphs are from the, from the book. So. Okay, so wrap up, summary. NAS has unsolvable problems, computing power grows exponentially. That seems to be pretty much clear. And that's going to go on for a little while at least. Consciousness may emerge. Quantum stuff is the big unknown. And scans, exponential growth. Well, dead scans are getting pretty good. We just saw it. Although we failed to see the movie. Uh, but live scans are probably pretty difficult, in my opinion. OK, so if we cannot scan the brain, if we cannot scan the brain so well, maybe we can still build the brain. Why? Because the brain maybe has some very simple general principles that it is built on. Simple rules. You all maybe know the Mandelbrot set. These pretty pictures. Julia sets and uh, two sets. This is a very simple complex function. It just gets iterated and then you get these pictures. Just iterating a very simple complex function, you get very complex looking pictures. And even on your iPhone, you can grow fractals. So maybe the brain, although it looks a little bit more disorganized than these fractals, this uh, set, these sets, maybe it's just based on that. The basic structure maybe is simple. Or maybe the brain is simple, basically. Okay, well, another thing that Mr. Kurzweil mentions in this context is the uh, discovery, or the rediscovery actually, of cellular automata by Stephen Wolfram, the guy who wrote Mathematica, that, which at least some people know, I suppose, Mathematica famous software in mathematics. The discovery that these simple rules, okay, this is this is a rule which says if you have three black dots, then you create one white dot. If you have two and one, then you get a white one. On the other end, if you have one and two, then you get a black one and so on. And you apply this rule and you get complicated patterns. From very simple from one simple rule, you get this. From some other rule, you get this. Looks very complicated, right? And this could be already the inside of your brain. And there's holes there, maybe. This is an Alzheimer's brain. OK, anyway. Uh, so maybe these kind of things, this kind of mathematics, these kind of simple rules can explain how brains are basically built and uh, exhibit very complex behavior. Of course, this thing is known since Turing, because uh, Turing, the guy with the uh, com computer programs, right? He invented this program in which was very simple and proved his theorem using that. So we already know that very complex things, unsolvable problems, can be created using simple rules. In fact, if you set it up correctly, these uh, cellular automata that Stephen Wolfram considered they can be used to encode Turing machines. So they are just as complicated. So they are unsolvable problems, right? You start with a bunch of simple rules and you say, what happens? Well, we don't know. We will learn about it. Okay. So, simple brain. <coughs> so maybe the brain can be built according to simple rules, but then what do you do? It's just a brain according to simple rules. Then you have to educate it. You can educate it. Well, in the real world, that's difficult. In some virtual reality, maybe on the internet, you educate it on the internet, there will be some problems educating on the internet. Don't you think? Ah, anyway, educate on the internet. Uh, but that's basically what we are doing with human beings right now, right? 
but we are using computers, so maybe we can do it at a million times the speed, so maybe we can create something like a human being educated on the internet. And that, then, that would be sort of the singularity, right? Then we have created a human being using <coughs> simple rules, powerful computer, and the internet, the information on the internet. And there it is. It can, well, work for us. Let's hope that it will work for us. Let's hope that it doesn't have too much of its own mind. Okay, further questions. If you are looking for personal immortality, what are we going to do if we scan the brain, make a copy of you? What do we do with the original? Do we keep it so we get two? Do we destroy it? Do we destroy the, or the original? So you uh, lie down as a human being and you wake up as a robot and your body is at ceremony. Okay, what about the body? That is a difficult question, right? Don't we have to create the body? If this is supposed to be a human being, it must have a body. I wouldn't be myself without all that fat. No? We have to have a body. What about the body? Another interesting thing, which also has a lot to do with the brain, is the immune system. What are we going to do with the immune system? The brain plays a big role in the immune system, apparently. So, we do with it? What about the body once more? Where does this computer mind live? Well, I just suggested that it lives on the internet, but if we want to make a human being, it should live in reality, so it should have a body, and it lives in the real world. Furthermore, another part of being, uh, oops. Oh, yeah, yeah. being a human being is all the things inside our bodies that are not human. <coughs> our body is colonized by bacteria. If you look at DNA inside our bodies, there's actually 10 times as much DNA which is not human, which is not in your chromosomes, inside your body, inside microbes, bacteria, E. coli. So what are we going to do with all that shit? So, finally, voluntary extra credit homework, what about free will? What does all this mean for free will? Okay, now, my final answer, and I guess I made it on time, amazing. Final answer. In 2045, say, computers will emulate human beings, in particular, pass the so-called Turing test. I didn't explain what that was, I guess. So they will be able to talk like human beings, like the guy in the Chinese room was able to speak Chinese. They'll be able to speak Japanese or English or whatever. They'll be able to converse. Uh, e kaiwa, right? They can do e kaiwa. Uh, human, uh, computers will be able to do e kaiwa like human beings. You will not be able to tell them, distinguish them from human beings. They will, of course, play Ego better than humans. At the moment, computers cannot play ego very well. Uh, Shogi, apparently, they are catching up just now. Chess already, when was it? Five years? Ten years. Ten years ago, the best human player was beaten by a computer, IBM computer. Uh, they run far better software so that. They can be basically human beings, and they will especially, I don't know how human they will be, but they will be conscious, and they will be creative, and so on. I'm not so sure that they'll be able to think exactly like us, <coughs> they'll be able to make mistakes like we do, or live in a realistic human environment. I mean, Asimo is running around there, but I mean, that is not not really close to a human being, right? So I'm not sure that this is possible. What I don't think is possible, that we can prove, you know, unsolvable problems, you know? Once we have built the computer that is supposed to imitate a brain, we won't be able to prove anything about it. Unsolvable problems, 
So the very first results that we talked about in math come into play there after all. I don't think that they will be able to live uh, bodily in, a, in the real world. Uh, they will not probably contain exact copies of specific people's brains. Who is going to agree to this kind of thing? I don't know. So uh, anyway, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to do it. And they will probably, indeed, not make us personally immortal. So, but I said there will be much better software. They'll be conscious and creative. So they will take over evolution. <coughs> best human beings or things similar to human beings will be computers, not human beings. So my final, final answer is, my final answer is, what happens after the singularity, after the singularity, after the point when the computers have taken over? We don't know what happens after the singularity, of course, but we can hope that the gods that we create, here is a god created by human beings a long time ago, a slightly more recent god here. <coughs> I put them together because they come from almost the same spot in Austria. She comes from Augsburg, although she's called the genius of Willendorf, and he comes from Tar. So they are sort of in, within bicycling distance of each other anyway. So these gods that we create, let's hope that the gods we build will be <laughs> kind to us. Let's hope that the gods that we build will be kind to us. Thank you. We do have time. You can ask questions. <laughs>
こう感情とかいうより多分体を動かすとかっていう技術の開発のなんか個人的には簡単なような気がするんですが要するに体を作って今あの人工の皮膚みたいなのを貼り付けてそしたら全く人間と変わらないようなものが生きるんでしょうかいやそれはすごく難しいと思いますよだってどういう材料を使いますか人間のような皮膚を使おうなら作るなら人間,の人,人間の皮膚しかないじゃないですか人間と同じじゃなくて例えば外見から見て人間と分からない例えば店員がロボットで、まあ、外見からはできるかもしれませんけどもそうでさえ難しいですねマダム・トゥソーに行けばあのお任されるわからない<笑>言ってないし<笑>かな多分話って全然割と単純な話で、私が言うと、はい、大人の人間と赤ちゃんとでどこが違うんだっていう話になって当然のことながらいろいろ感じたり感じなかったりっていうのは違うレベルありますよねそこどこが違うんだろうっていうところで多分質問答えが出そうな気がするんですけど生物じゃないから分かりませんけどねはいまず他に質問ありますできるだけ皆さんどんな話質問でもいいんですけれどもえっと、全然話変えてもいいですけど、えー、こういう時にはえタムさん「Why2045」ああこれはこのあのレッスンと同時エクスポネンシャルグロースオブコンピューティングパワー right? So actually the computing power of course has already reached the level of a human brain, right? K is already maybe a human brain, right? So, so why is it not now, right? Well, the reason is that the software is not developed, right? So we have to give an estimate of how the software improves. And that's how he comes up with it. So actually, the, the, the secret there is the software. I see. So but of course, that is very difficult to predict, right? Because you don't even know how good the software is that we have right now. So you, you cannot really uh, talk about exponential growth in that area. But that's what he thinks uh, is going to be. I see. So both 2045 is just 30 years later from now. Yes. So not so far, not so close. So that, uh, we, maybe we will we be, we be not, not say at the time, but uh, young people uh, will be still alive yes. at, 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 at an age or around 50 or something like that. You talk about the human beings、uh, difficult to make, but、uh, I had. I read some article that、um, the memory is now a computer の情報にして保存する技術ができそうになってるみたいな記事を読んだことがありましてあのどこで読んだことか覚えてないんですけどそれができるようになった場合ってそれ読,読,み読み取れる読みスキャンできるいやスキャンかどうかわからないんですけどってかもちろんあの量的はまあできるんじゃないですかねあのそれができた場合って例えばアルツハイマーとかでその記憶を失った人の情報をあのコンピューターとかに保存しておいてそれをこう脳にもう一度戻すみたいなことができた場合である意味不老不死みたいなでどうやって取り出すどうやってスキャンするどうやって読み取るいやそれは忘れましたけどそういうのができた場合ってそれも不思議特にあのもうアルツハイマー始めかけたところでなんかどうやって出すかなんかもうちゃんと喋れない例えばそうするからどうするねちょっと難しいですね生物的なものでもわかりますよね多分さんね、うん、そのメタバインフォメーションデータメニューデータのインサイト、はいそれだとデータキャンビーキャンビーストアインディアナダプレイス、そう、メビーインフューチャー、アンゼイユフハブサンプログラムインザブレイン、そう、データウィズカミンバック、バイ、サンプログラム。はい、僕はなお
じゃないと思いますけどでもまあどう,どうすればいいそしてまあ例えばあの let's see I had this frog there right it seems like a frog including the frog brain you can freeze actually you can freeze it and when you thaw it it will revive but of course you can't ask the frog are you still the same person right So if you do the same thing to a human brain, freeze and thaw it, we don't know what's going to happen. If we, are we going to lose our memories, or important memories, or our personality? Or is actually the structure, the neurons, axons, dendrites that remain, presumably, is that going to be sufficient? Is this going to be our memories? Are our memories really stored in these physical connections or are there other things? Nobody really knows that yet, I think. Yes, I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. Please take a look at your hand. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. ロボットは将来的に人間みたいに何か経験をしてそこで失敗をしてそこから学んで次に生かすみたいな経験を通して学ぶっていうのは可能なんですか可能ですよ可能ですよそれもやったことがありますあのヌーラルネットワークなどがありますよだからあの小さいどうですか応用がありますよはいコンピューターはそういうことはできますいろんな試みがあるあるんですよ。でも人間の脳は結構大きいシステムですからね。それに応用できるかどうかわかりません。そしてこの研究はもうもう20年30年前からやってるから、そしてそんなに進歩してないんですよ。どこかにあの引っかかってるんですね。はい。他に何か質問ですか。
はいどうぞ生物とかあちらですね。行ければいいもいいですけどでもまあもちろんこのなんかな,などこっちなあればどうかできるかもしれない。はい他にあってもサポありますよ。はいどうぞ。